Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, evening special session of our Pursue One Europathology. Today, uh, we have a special person to give a talk on uh, the various uh, interesting cases in Europathology. And we have with us uh, Dr. Sambit Mahanti. Uh, I would call him uh, the golden pathologist because he has got gold medal in almost everything which he has worked upon. He's an internationally acclaimed pathologist and uh, it's an honor that he is here and his uh, area of interest is uh, Europath and many other, especially digital path and molecular pathology. Uh, I would request him to straight away start. Uh, Dr. Mahanti, please take over, please. Uh, Dr. Mahanti, you can uh, unmute your uh, thing and just share your screen, please. Hello. Okay, we are having some technical issues. I mean, I think we'll be very soon uh, getting Dr. Mahanti online and requesting everybody to please uh, keep your unmute uh, muted as well as your screen, your video off. We are waiting for Dr. Mahanti to join in. We will just take a minute. Everybody, please keep your uh, audio as well as video off. Please keep your microphone as well as video off, please.
we are having some issues in trying to get the link from bhubaneswar just give us a minute we'll be uh, live online dr mohant is trying to uh, get his link uh, connected to the server the server link is fine but the link from bhubaneswar is having some issues i think the weather there is not okay just give us a minute please
microphone. Yeah, I did it now. Now I can hear you. Hello. Hello. We can hear you, Dr. Manti. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sharing my screen right now. Yeah, please share your screen. Uh, I'm, now we are in the in, absolutely link is there. So please okay. share your screen. Yeah, sure. So once you share your screen, you have to share your PPT. Yeah, sure. I'm doing that in a second. Opening. Yes. Now I can open it. Sorry, everyone, and good evening. And I'm. Sorry I can't, we can't see your PPT yet, Dr. Mahanti. We can't see your PPT yet. How about now? Can uh, you see now? No, no, not yet. Actually, you have to go to share screen. Present now. Okay. Press present now. Yes, I got it. Yeah, and got then it, you got put, put the, uh, uh, the full I, screen. It, yeah. Just present now, full screen. Yes. And then you share your PPT. Can you see now? Uh, not yet, not yet. Share. I shared the entire screen. Yeah, and then uh, what you do is you click on the screen and you say share. Now, yeah, yeah, it's coming. It's coming. It's right. coming. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Now, that's now you coming. can make it full screen. Make it full screen. Yeah. Yes. Great. So we are now on target. Please take over. Thank you so much. Sure. Sorry for thank the inconvenience. You. No, no. It's, yeah. it, I'm, I'm like, good evening, everyone. I'm extremely sorry for the inconvenience. I actually used another laptop and it's completely screwed up. So again, sorry for the 15 minutes delay, almost like 17 minutes delay. So without wasting time, what I thought, like I will go over a few challenging scenarios, but they are not exactly challenging ones. It may be very normal for some of you, but for trainees who are in the MDD and BDCP of residency program or the, those who are the young in pathology, it may be a little challenging. So I always use this slide uh, with a philosophical thing, which I borrowed it from my mentor, Dr. Amin, and used it in most of my presentations just to show like h &E is not dying. It is the gold standard. We have to use, we have to give a lot of respect to the pink and blue to give a diagnosis and utilize that maximally to help our patients. And the rest, all are ancillary. We can live without IHC, we can live without exome, transcriptome, next gen sequencing, but we cannot live without a good h &E state. So from the first case, uh, which is relatively young women with recent onset, acute onset left Blank pain in the kidney area. And no other constitutional symptom, no weight loss, no fever, nothing, just a blank pain. And an ultrasound was done. There was about a three centimeter mass in the left renal cortex. It was hyperechoic and the mass was vascular. Well circumscribed. So this was this is the mass with the four stars or the X signs. And it has some vascular edges, this black area, it's surrounded by vessels, pretty well circumscribed. So the patient was admitted as the mass was in one of the poles. It was small. The patient is young. So the urologist thought for going for a nephron sparing nephrectomy or a partial nephrectomy. And we usually get frozen section, intraoperative consult for partial, uh, this partial nephrectomy specimen to see the tumor is completely excised or not, the margin is positive or negative, the parenchymal margin, and what kind of tumor. They are, most of the time, they are very curious to know. 
Uh, actually, just I want to highlight one thing here, which is kind of a take-home message for the procedure. If your parenchymal margin is positive in a partial nephrectomy specimen, it doesn't add any value for the further intraoperative management because positivity doesn't make it like the surgeon is going to give you more tissue. Like in a whipple resection, suppose you're saying your margin is positive. The GI surgeon is going to give you a little more pancreatic tissue, but here that doesn't hold good. Because studies have shown, which is published in the European Journal of Virology a few years ago, a positive margin versus negative margin doesn't show significant difference or any difference at all in assessing. Mostly, we just have to look for the concavity of uh, the convexity of the mass is kind of completely excised, and what is the type of tissue. And if it's an oncocytoma, you feel good, like you're dealing with a uh, low grade tumor. But trust me, do not, I mean, I, this is kind of a recommendation for my fellow pathologists do not try to give a final diagnosis of the histologic type of tumor in a partial nephrectomy. So, what happened in this? So, this is the tumor. Uh, the tumor is kind of brown, tan brown, with white area in the center, fairly circumscribed. This is a perinephric bat, some kidney, and some convolution, a little bit of hemorrhage. It doesn't really look cystic with a yellow color of a renal cell carcinoma. It doesn't have a friable surface. It's more smooth and glistening, a tiny, and it does have it doesn't have an exactly mahogany brown, but it has brown and tan and brown mixed color and some amount of hemorrhage. The margin was negative. So usually, uh, with a lot of regard to my PGI training, I always do an intraoperative script cytology in all my frozen just to save time. I can do something in like two minutes instead of waiting for 20 minutes or having a section. So I did an intraoperative cytology of that mass. So what we have in this picture, we have this pink structure. And the cells are trying to like apart or drape the structure with some cells in the center. And it was a pretty cellular smear. Mm, cells are not clear. That one thing you can see. They are round or there are some, some are spindle, mostly round. And they have some amount of cytoplasm. I'll go to another picture. And if you see the cell around to polyhedral to polygonal, they have a little bit of eccentricity, more or less round to eccentric nucleus. Chromatin is dense with some inclusion, which has a color similar to the cytoplasmic, uh, the cytoplasm here, a little uh, not like a nucleoli. The, the nucleoli is inconspicuous. I do see a groove, OK? And this is the intraoperative frozen section slide, it looks like thyroid follicles and they are, the thyroid follicles are kind of lined by these cells. The cells are cuboidal. Density ratio is maintained with mild increase in the nuclear size, maybe with a small nucleus. So what is it? It was a few years ago, like in 2014 or so. So can anyone tell me some kind of diagnosis, how to deal with such kind of a frozen section when the urologist is after your life to know the diagnosis? He doesn't care much about the margin. Anyone? Any diagnosis so far from the intraoperative consultation? Am I audible? So no diagnosis from the house. So how I dealt with this case, I said the surgical margin of excision is negative for tumor. There was no tumor. It looks like thyroid follicle, or it could be something coming from the thyroid. How is the thyroid in this case? Carcinoid of the kidney, or it is like an end stage kidney, and the surgeon told me the ecotexture of the kidney is normal, the size is normal, it is not contracted, it is not granular, the other kidney is normal, you react to the normal, and the thyroid, he doesn't know, but he said, definitely I'm going to look into the thyroid. But so far, I don't have anything else to do. I have taken out the complete tumor. So let's, 
So in the permanent section, which is what we have, we are again this thyroid follicle with some architectural distortion, some outbound chicles and infolding, some areas which looks like lymphocytic thyroiditis, a lot of follicular destruction follicles, some fibrosis. In these areas, the fibrotic areas, the cells look small with scan cytoplasm, they look atrophic. And these are the areas where there is fracturing of the mm, and scalloping of the colloid. So we thought probably it is something coming from the thyroid as a follicular or a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma because the groove and the infusion, carcinoid with prominent follicular differentiation, thyroid that you use with ESRD, but the ESRD was out. The patient is female, so probably it is a stroma ovary with malignant transformation at the metastatic site. But the pelvic ultrasound or vaginal examination was normal. Pet CT was negative, thyroid scan and examination of other systems, they're all within normal limit. So I need help here. So you guys have to speak it, speak out now. I seriously need help here to work up the case. Anyone? No participation? Dr. Nadeem, you are around? Uh, Sambit, this is Nandita here. Hi. Hi, Hi, Dr. Kakkar. Hi, Dr. Nandita. How are you? Uh, the residents should come up. Yeah. Ask the residents to come up, please. Yeah. Do, do we have residents? We have residents and the fellows. I mean, the senior resident, resident, and the DM students. Please come up with. I really need help here. I do not know what to do. If you do not speak, I won't proceed. Please help me here. What Wait should I do? Room, there's no problem here. Yeah. Please speak out. I know we have the best set of residents in our country. So please speak out. The pet city was negative. There was nothing else in the rest of the organ. I'm working this cup in case in 2013-14. I have no idea what I'm doing. Thyroid scan was normal. Everything was normal. The ecotexture of the kidney is normal. We are near normal. So I do not know what to do. Yes. Yeah, please be loud. Anyone? So I thought like I'll go for some immunohistochemistry to know what it, the first of all, I was not sure I'm dealing with a tumor of the kidney or I'm dealing with a tumor coming from the thyroid gland. Because sometimes what happens, there may not be anything in the thyroid, but you have an occult metastasis. So I need to know these are thyroidal in origin or they're renal or metanephric in origin. So I have no idea, thinking that I put some stain. So what I did, initially I did one stain for thyroid and one stain for kidney. So for kidney, I do not like CD10 a lot. So I did a PAX2 and a PAX8. And for thyroid, I did TDF1. So what happened, the cells were positive for PAX2 and TTF1. Here, what, what I just learned, if I do PAX8, PAX8 is going to be positive in thyroid as well as in the kidney, so it doesn't help. So PAX2 is a better marker, and I have seen that CD10 can be positive in both the scenarios. But your, my TTF1 is dead negative, it is completely negative. Thyroglobulin was negative. It was strong, bright, positive, like a Christmas tree. Every nuclei were positive brown for PAX2. All the proximal tubular markers like CD10, RCC antigen, and neuroendocrine markers and after chromo 56 were negative. KI67 was about 6-7%. It was low. It's about 5%, I would say. So, what is the diagnosis? The thyroid-like follicular carcinoma of the kidney. So let's talk about this entity. Is an extremely uncommon entity, not that common. We are, Santos must be having some cases, Dr. Nandita must be having a few cases, I have a few cases. So the cases where you see a lot of geo uh, urologic pathology, you do come across this kind of tumor. There is another variant also, which is a thyroid-like follicular carcinoma with papillary-like nuclear features. There is no gender predilection. It is a wide age range. They can be small, they can be big. There are two cases with seven and nine centimeter. 
they look like well differentiated follicle derived thyroid follicular neoplasm and there are only a couple of cases renal, uh, with regional metastasis and occasional ones with distant met. So what are, the, what are the pathologic attributes we need to know when you work up these kind of cases? They are well circumscribed, they have a homogeneous cat scar surface because of the colloid. If I go back to my slide, which I did not say deliberately on the growth examination, it does have that not exactly the beefy red appearance of a thyroid, but it does have a glistening thing. If you see cases of like oncocytoma, it looks uniformly, any pink tumor of the kidney, they look uniformly brown. And you have a central scar, you may not have a central scar, but you're uniformly here. What we're looking at here, if you look at by the color scheme, what Dr. Rosa used to tell us during our fellowship, you have a brown color and you have tan can is representing something else and the brown is representing something else on microscopy. Plus hemorrhage is kind of rare in those three tumors like oncocytoma. So and even hysterochemically they show classical positivity for the renal tubule associated markers like low molecular cytokeratin by maintain PAX2 and PAX8. I would say do not waste your money doing PAX8 when thyroid is a differential because thyroid is also going to be positive for PAX8 because it stains malarian, thyroid, and metanephric tumor. PAX2 is fairly specific here. Again, I'm saying it is fairly specific. There's nothing in immuno world is completely specific. They're negative for TTF1 and thyroglobulin. They're mostly negative for CK7, RCC, CD10, and PAX8 also sometimes. So it's kind of a plus minus thing. <laughs> So you can do one on one on one and you have the answer. And the differential again is carcinoid with prominent follicular differentiation, thyroidization vertebule of a chronic pyelonephritis in end stage renal disease, stroma opera with malignant transformation at a metastatic site and our metastatic thyroid carcinoma. Imaging has no role here. And preoperative middle core biopsy, a cell block. Is, can be done, like MD Anderson people, they still do little core biopsy for the renal tumor just to differentiate is the primary renal neoplasm or metastatic. In that time, if you have immunoid, it does help. And that actually helps in managing the patient, which has a significant management and prognostic, prognostic implications. Benign in majority cases, so partial nephrectomy is adequate. Again, margin status, I already went over. So to take home message for this, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a bad throat, but go with though, is a relatively rare and distinct neoplasm, renal tubular neoplasm, or epithelial neoplasm that should be distinguished from its malignant mimics. Overall, it has a low grade malignant potential. It is not a benign tumor completely, but from the aggressive one. Overall prognosis is favorable, recurrence and metastasis are rare. A correct diagnosis of the primary renal neoplasm and differentiate it from the metastatic tumor, which is coming from elsewhere, would help in appropriately decide what decide like what management should be taken and how to work with the patient. So any question in this case, then I'll move on to the next one. Dr. Nandita, any question? Uh, I think your resident we, we are not taking interactive uh, things because mm. of uh, uh, you know issues uh, with the time and all go one way. We'll okay, go one way. Cool, cool. okay, okay, sorry. Okay, for the next one, I thought I would just go over a problem in urologic pathology. We all come across, we get TURP tips. For the resident, I just want to clarify one thing, transurethral resection of prostate versus TURBT. When we are doing TURBT, we are cystoscopy, we are basically going into the bladder and plugging out, uh, taking out the, we pluck out the bladder tumor. QRP, we are sampling the central zone of the prostate. We are going through the urethra and taking out the central zone. The way we are taking out the central zone, we are taking out the bladder neck musculature. If we have a poorly differentiated high grade tumor in the bladder neck, the sample from the bladder neck, because bladder neck is sampled in QRP specimen. So, what to do? Let's go over a few cases and see. So, we have two cases in the left and the right. The right one looks a little better, maybe a lot of clear cytoplasm, a little more clear cytoplasm from the right one. 
The right one has nesting pattern with a stroma in between, which is inflammatory, and uh, sorry, on the left one, and the right one has some holes, the fear cytoplasm, some signet ring cells, and again, this has muscle. So the bladder neck muscle is involved in this high grade carcinoma, um, and so we do not know which one is bladder and which one is prostate. Probably this clearing in this kind of hinting a little towards prostate. And here, this kind of a nesting or a vague urothelial nest kind of appearance hinting towards bladder, but are we sure? We are not. So uh, after workup, the left one turned out to be a bladder and the right one turned out to be a prostate, but why we are even worried to do this? Traditionally, what happens, a bladder tumor, like in this case, this case is a pretty straightforward case. Why? We have large nest, the muscle, and the cell has a hard cell border, or we can see a lot of cytoplasm, which is pink. There's no plastic reaction. Here, the dysplasia is minimal. We have nest with clear cytoplasm, and the nuclear cytoplasmic ratio is maintained. So it's kind of a pretty straightforward case to say, and it is forming a gland prostate versus the bladder. However, and when you get surface neoplasia, we have CIS, nest and broad shooting pattern of arrangement, marked nuclear pleomorphism, a uh, prominent cell border with glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm, what I say hard glassy eosinophilic cytoplasm, and presence of thinnest differentiation, it favors the endothelial carcinoma, whereas you see asinine, fibriform pattern, nest, seeds, cells, even at the highest rate, they retain their nuclear monotony with prominent conspicuous nucleoli and a pale clear to cytoplasm with crystalloid and blue mucin, it favors a prostate carcinoma. But things are not that easy in real life. This is another case from a TUR specimen. On the right side, the little one is a focus of prostatic acid adenocarcinoma glycian fork, probably with triptoforming, and this amphophilic sort of cytoplasm, some clearing. Nuclear monotony is maintained, whereas on the right side, the cells look ugly. They are big, they are pleomorphism, they have prominent chromocenters, have chromasia, big cells. So it's a case, a case with coexistent UCA and PCA, urothelial carcinoma and prostatic carcinoma. Again, PSA in high grade tumor, I would recommend you not to do PSA if, in a focus, you are thinking of a prostatic differential in a metastatic site or somewhere else, like in this location, and the nuclei is really high grade, and PSA doesn't help. Again, about one third of the PS, one third of high grade prostatic adenocarcinoma, they get highlighted by PSA. PSA is useless, you rather use NK3.1. And this diagnostic difficulty is also compounded by negative PSA in the high grade tumor, and also PSA is fairly non specific for prostate. It tends a lot of extra prostatic organs even in female breast. The benign structures like urethral glands, panacels, cells, breast endometrium, nephrosonic adenoma, cystitis glandularis, a lot of structures which are positive for PSA. And malignancy, again, a little percentage of bladder adenocarcinoma is also positive for PSA. So what to do? Why this distinction is important? Everything we do, we want to make our patient happy so that they can get a correct diagnosis, they'll have a correct treatment, and they go home. If a TUR specimen has a high grade tumor that turns out to be urothelial carcinoma, it is at least a stage 2B tumor. And in prostate, it is a stage 3A tumor. In spite, in prostate, the 5 to 10 year survival ranges from 81 to 900 percent. Here, it is less in urothelial carcinoma, again, the therapy. If it is in the TUR specimen, that means it is outside the premises of the prostate gland. So radical prostatectomy is not the treatment of choice. If the urologist gets, the urologist has done a TUR specimen to alleviate urinary retention symptoms. The patient came for BPH, they did a TUR, the patient went home happily. But that TUR specimen, after three, four days, had a cancer. If it turned out to be prostate, then radical prostatectomy is not the treatment. They will go for hormone deprivation therapy or ADT, androgen deprivation therapy. 
and there are also the role of CMET inhibitor, VEGF inhibitor, nexalitinib, or anti PFMA, and pan AKG inhibitor. And for urocelial carcinoma treatment, here is a prostatectomy, chemotherapy, and they will probably chase after HER2 or go for an mTOR inhibitor. So they are therapeutically and prognostically different. So what we did uh, in 2011, we did a study to differentiate and come up with what is the best marker with a limited marker, with a research limited setting, what we can do to differentiate this tumor. So we picked up a few urothelial markers like GATA3, S100P, CK556, E63, uroplatin 23 and some PSA, PSMA, androzole receptor, NK3.1 and P501S for prostate. Uh, so, a few words about GATA3 for the uh, trainees. GATA3 is becoming fairly non specific nowadays, but it's good if breast and bladder are not in the differential. GATA3 can be positive in very, very rarely in prostate cancer, but it's a good marker for bladder. It's a T cell transcription factor. It stains all the autonomic nervous system tumors, including paraganglioma's, neuroblastomas, parathyroid tumors. And s 100 p do not use it now. We did it that time, but it's kind of a dirty stain. I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's a placental S100. Europlacin 2. In our experience, Europlacin 2 or 3 are good if the tumor looks like bladder. If the tumor doesn't do the serial, then Europlacin 2 and 3 hardly helps. Prostate. Prostate is positive across the patient grade pattern and metastatic status of prostate cancer. And NKX3.1, I love this marker, this is a prostatic. It is in the downstream pathway of androgen receptor. It's a nuclear marker. It stains prostatic epithelium, testes, and all the other structures, but it's a great marker when you are differentiating a bladder from prostate. PSMA, which is a membrane antigen, and ARG. ARG doesn't help much, but it can be positive in 40 to 80% of tumors, and in the high grade tumor, the positivity rate is low. So, if you see, 100% of our cases are positive for GATA3 in this case, and you see the result with Europlacin 3 is very, very hopeless. Only 20% of the cases are highlighted by Europlacin 3. And 2 is also not great, it's only 70%. 720, I'll come to the slide, and in prostate, NKX 3.1, P501S, and PSMA, they are great markers. AR is not a great marker when you are differentiating bladder from prostate because few cases of bladder can be positive for androgen receptor. Again, PSA is hopeless, is one fourth of the cases. So the upper panel is GATA3 positivity in urothelial carcinoma, and the lower panel is PCA, prostatic carcinoma, which is dead negative for GATA3, S1 and CK56 and P63. They are positive in bladder. Again, the positivity rate is low because of the high grade tumor. Just remember, P63 can be positive in atrophic variant, and a few of the rare non atrophic variants of prostate cancer. But classically, by definition, fundamentally, they are P63 and CK556 negative. Europlacin is a membrane stain, with sometimes with a collagen accentuation next to the nucleus. Just a few words about 7 and 20, about 20% of prostate cancer in the literature, they are positive for 7 and 20 together, and about 40% of bladder, they are going to be 7 and 20 positive together. So 7 20 doesn't really help, but it is both positive, it favors more bladder than prostate. PSA, which you must be kind of staining in prostate, very moderate kind of staining, and bladder it is negative. NKX is a nuclear stain, strong nuclear positivity, and P501S, is the cytoplasmic stain with accentuation. PSMA membrane and AR is the nucleus stain. ARG, again, nucleus stain, it was positive only in only 35% of the cases. So we derived from this study, in along with other studies, so I'm not going to go over all this. Your GATA and H100P are good markers for, I mean, or P63. I do not personally use it. So we did it that time for bladder and NKX, PSM, and P501S for prostate. So, in a resource limited setting, not to waste antibodies, at least two of the each marker, which is highlighted in yellow, to determine the lineage. I'm not using the linear specific marker, the linear associated, because there is 
some amount of linear infidelity among this marker. And it all depends on the experience of the individual and how the laboratory is performing. Coming on to the stage, case three, I'll take the questions at the end. Is a 64 year old woman, man with a history of renal transplant? Is a post transplant guy and CT exam showed a 5 by 3 centimeter mass involving the left bladder wall and cystoscopy in the left bladder wall shows the hypertrophy without any specific mass, probably some kind of a, the mass, it was more like a hypertrophy of the left bladder wall with a smooth contoured elevation of 5 cm rather than a specific mass eh, and there was, it was non-pedunculated with erythema. A TURBT was formed. So this is what we have. We have the thin wall veins, the muscle and their their vestibules. I would say they are like round contoured gland or cyst-like structures starting from the epithelium on the right side, uh, they are going to the left the infiltrating. So there's an infiltrative region with small tubules or gland to larger cyst-like structures and they're getting into the muscularis propria. These are the mucosy muscles with the thin muscles. These are the thicker work bottle and th the thin muscles are kind of next to these veins in the lamina propria. Again, if you see here, they are a variable size and shape. Some are elongated, some are oblong, and if you go to high part, they have a thick basement membrane. The cells are polyhedral, the nucleus is really enlarged. It has, more or less, if you see, they look like full of fish. What I mean, they look alike, all these nuclei. The chromatin texture is also similar. They have a small nucleolus. They do not, I mean, the cell, the nuclear chromatin texture of the cells, they do not differ from each other. That is one thing to point, and they have a thick basement membrane. If you, if they, these cells, they do so a little more, a pical com compartment of the, these cells have more eosinophilic cytoplasm and some cells are kind of trying to get out of the cell, sort of a hobnailing. So again, what to do? So I thought of probably I'm dealing with a prosthetic adenocarcinoma, a urothelial carcinoma at glandular dispensation, clear cell carcinoma or a nephrosomic metaplasia versus adenoma, given the history of renal transplant. Did some stain and to cover all the differentials. It was positive for CK7 and 20, and positive for CK7, 20 was negative. I'll come to the next this slide again later. And P63 was negative, PSA was negative, PSA negative, NK3.1 negative. So my data 3 was negative, so bladder and prostate are out. It was positive for human kidney injury molecule 1, CK7, PAX8, and ACE100A1, which is a marker for renal tubules, the entire nephron. So I can clearly know this, I'm dealing with a nephrogenic adenoma because this tumor has, this lesion, or this tumor-like lesion has a derivation from the metanephron. So the benign epithelial lesions of the urinary tract, which are characterized by tubules, gland, papillary lesions, Excuse me, just give me one second. Something happened. So, as you say, nephrogenic adenoma, I won't go over the entire slide. These are the, because of instrumentation, the cells they set out from the renal tubules and they come and harbor anywhere along the urothelial tract. And these are also proven by cytogenetic studies that derive from the renal tubules. They give a tubular glandular pattern if you're lucky, but it can be very, very fibromyxoid and pseudo-infiltrative, giving the appearance of all these differentials. And the nuclei can be very prominent and they show resonativity here. They can show papillary picture, they infiltrate the muscle, they have a lot of basophilic cytoplasm with mucin in the, and they sometimes look like squamous cells and thyroid line. All these pictures. So the differentials are always three cancers, clear cell carcinoma of the bladder, adenocarcinoma of the prostate, and pseudophilial carcinoma with nested and glandular pattern. 
give me one second there is some issue with this animation thing okay so well, now i fixed it so if i go back to this pattern so what we really bothers the pathologist if it is infiltrated and the cells are showing more than this radiated here the cytoplasm is more clear less eosinophilic and the cells are hobnailed then you kind of think of am i dealing with something erroneous but if it's hobnailed and you have flat cells with much nuclei you are really worried what you are dealing with so what are the subtle differences in morphology differentiating a nephrogenic adenoma from prostatic axillary adenoma the overlapping features that they both so pseudo infiltrate nephrogenic adenoma is also infiltrated and prostatic is infiltrated they both have prominent nuclei so they both lack the basal cilia they both are negative for p63 and ck556 and amicar or rest image is going to be positive in nephrogenic adenoma and prostatic axillary adenoma what are the features which favor a prostatic cancer it is a more homogeneous tumor cell population they can have to perform structure and the solid or to perform pattern if involved in the bladder and cystic atrophic and the positive for the prostatic marker which are negative in nephrogenic adenoma urothelial versus nephrogenic adenoma common features the both can have tubular pattern glandular architecture mixed stroma infiltration solid nest but in situ component a cis would be negative no papillary component and deep invasion into the muscle are all present in urothelial carcinoma but trust me i have seen nephrogenic adenoma in invading the deep muscle urothelial marker is obviously positive here and the negative in nephrogenic adenoma you don't have to do all the same and among clear cell adenocarcinoma in a female with hobnailing lot of clearing the problem comes with the clear cell adenocarcinoma of the bladder or coming from the gi tract tubular tubular cystic and solid nested pattern more in favor of nephrogenic adenoma however you can have the similar picture with atp in nephrogenic adenoma as clear cell carcinoma so what you see in clear cell carcinoma you see prominent nuclear pleomorphism the school of fish appearance is lost what i mean by school of fish the atp is not repetitive it is one cell look completely different from the neighbor or from two cells apart the cells are looking different they do not look like they are derived from the same same lineage or for the same family you see frequent mitotic activity very high ki67 they may be positive for p53 and ck20 but instead of going to the aminos don't jump into the amino you can have a morphology answer so we kind of published this study a few years ago so what we saw in nephrogenic adenoma these are four cases all the mimics the left one is the nephrogenic adenoma top one is the clear cell adenocarcinoma of the bladder bottom left is the bladder adeno and bottom right is the prostatic axillary adenocarcinoma if i go by the renal tubular marker a100 a1 is the renal tubule associated marker is positive in nephrogenic adenoma because it is derived from the renal tubule starting from the pct from the bowman capsule to the collecting duct is going to be positive everywhere and then dead negative in the other differentials pax2 again renal positive nuclear the negative in the rest pax8 again can be positive in bladder adenos about 30% of bladder adenos can be pax8 positive so it's not a great stain if a differential is a nephrogenic adenoma versus a bladder adeno hkim1 is a fairly good molecule it was discovered recently in a research lab is a kinky injury in normal kidney tubules do not express this kinky injury molecules when the tin <coughs> excuse me when the tubules are injured by instrumentation or by nephritis uh, like in chronic pyelonephritis and all they try to express this human kidney injury molecules as compared to the normal and the atrophic tubule it is positive in nephrogenic adenoma that again so it, it has a derivation from the injured tubular epithelial and is negative from the rest of the differential amica Amica is a bad stain to differentiate. Do not waste your money using Amica. It's going to be positive in all the four differentials of all the three differentials of nephrogenic adenoma in variable degree. It's positive in clear adeno. It's positive in conventional adeno and nested T C urothelial carcinoma and 
nephrotomy carcinoma. H100P again helps in differentiating UC and CCC is negative, is a negative stain, but do not, we don't have to worry to do a negative stain if we're studying, so we did it, but you're good with renal tubular marker. KI67 is low. If I go to this slide, your KI67 is extremely like 1% or almost nil in the prosthetic adenoma. And classically, just remember one thing prostate cancer, even if it is 5 plus 5 prostate, as in adenocarcinoma, the KI is usually low as compared to much low as compared to the urothelial carcinoma. And prostate cancers classically do not show significant peritumoral or intertumoral dysmorphism. That is something to remember. And so if you're doing a KI-67 to say it is a prostatic cancer versus a non-cancer, you're wasting your time and antibody. And again, if a prostate cancer is kind of transforming to a small cell carcinoma, you see KI-67 like this must be. That's a different scenario. So this is just in a montage, kind of a global view. You have all the tumors and the staining pattern. And what I said, this is basically all the tools. And the S100 we use in the lab is a cocktail of all the 16 S100 molecules. And A1 is for kidney, and P is for placenta, and for bladder. So by saying this tumor is this lesion, a tumor-like lesion. I'm sorry, I'm repeatedly saying this tumor. The tumor-like lesion positive for renal tubule associated marker indicate this is derived from the injured renal tubule and it is not urothelial carcinoma or clear cell or prostatic carcinoma. So the benign tumor-like entity which is associated with prior injury to the renal tubular epithelium and the cells, they kind of set out and they try to harbor anywhere along the urothelial tract from the pelvic junction to the penile tract. And so, and they have a range of morphologic patterns. They try to kind of infiltrate. They do not form cap a capsules around them. And these are the markers to differentiate it from other lesions. Let's go to the next case. We'll go slowly. It's a 70-year-old woman with a remote history of total abdominal hysterectomy and unilateral salping ovary. One tube and ovary is out and the uterus is out. And it was most likely for a benign lesion, what the patient said, but we did not have any chart to review or report to review the exact diagnosis. The patient here, the presenting complaint was a dull and progressively worsening lower abdominal pain, mostly in the pelvis, followed by hematuria. And it was, again, a painful hematuria. This is the image you can see here. You have the bladder, which is distended in the center. And it measured 15 centimeters in greatest dimension with severe wall distension. Why I'm saying severe wall distension, you hardly see anything. It is kind of thickened. It's like a chink-like lumen. And with the trigone of the bladder is inseparable from the anterior wall of the thickened vagina. It's stuck to it. The pouch of Douglas is, sorry, the, the, the space, the peritoneum between the bladder and the vagina, they are kind of stuck. Concerning there is some invasion. And cystoscopy showed severe hemorrhagic cystitis with multiple hemorrhagic area, necrotic tissue. So the surgeon went ahead with a transurethral resection. So what we receive in the transurethral resection here, we saw a tumor with variable histology. It has cystic areas and solid nesting pattern. So the solid nesting pattern and cystic area infiltrating the bladder and musculature. So it was a, at least a PT2 lesion. It has invaded the musculature, the stage 2 lesion, with cystic areas and solid areas. And in the cystic area, some cysts are lined by atrophic tubules or atrophic cells, and some cells have volumes of cytoplasm with sort of cobnilling, where the nucleus is trying to get out of the cell, and some cells without hobnilling. Uh, but the clearing is prominent. So we thought what it could be. My first thought in this case was of bladder adenocarcinoma. But why? And it's probably have infiltrated the bladder wall because it is infiltrating the muscle in the two RBD chips and invaded the vaginal epithelium. So it's 
a clear palladium cast in the black looking at the histology Uh, so these are the differentials. Here, the adeno carcinoma of the urethral tract or the GYN tract, because the vagina is still there, and the, one of the ovaries is there. So it could be a GYN tract, urethral clear cell carcinoma, or the clear cell carcinoma of the urethral tract. Clear cell features in a conventional urethral carcinoma, atypical nephrogenic adenoma, which was a far fetched thought just for completion. High grade serous carcinoma with clear cell features, renal cell, or a colorectal. There is a broad differential. Uh, Because there was tethering to the um, rectal wall, the the vagina is kind of effaced. So we thought of a colorectal carcinoma as well. So renal markers were done. Ax8 was positive. CK7 was positive. CK20 was positive. It was positive for one second. Amacar was positive. CK20 was negative. Uh, 20 and CDX2 were negative. Seven Amacar HMW CK. And HNF B1 and Pax8. HNF B1 positive, so we are again puzzled. Are we dealing with a clear cell adenoma of the bladder or clear cell adenoma of the GYN tract? Pax8 can be positive in both. So Pax2 and Pax8 doesn't really help differentiating clear cell from either tract, GYN tract or the GU tract. CK7 can be positive in both. Amacar gives a little hint to our bladder, and HMW CK also gives a little hint to our bladder. This tumor was. Negative for CK20, CDX2, so it's probably not colorectal. It was CTF1, WT1, all this negative. GATA3 was weakly positive. It was not good, but I considered in the beginning which was negative. Metastatic workup, including CD scan, bone scan, liver function tests, were all negative. There's no evidence of metastatic disease. This is a resection specimen. We have the pelvic anterior exenteration specimen. If you see, there is the The tumor is kind of a clamp here. It is a 6.7 centimeter papillary mass in the inferior aspect of the posterior bladder wall, involving the proximal urethra, extending through the detrusor muscle to the deep anterior vaginal wall. This kind of invading the deep anterior vaginal. This entire area is involved, including the margin. So, what is it? So, in morphology, we have these four kinds of area. You see on the top right. I'll start with a benign thing or a low grade thing. On the top right, it looks like nephrogenic adenoma, what we just saw a few slides ago. Vestibules, some hobnailing, uniformity, cystic area, and in the top left, you have glandular structures with a little variation in the nucleus size, but it looks like an adenocarcinoma. In this part, at least I can say these are infiltrative glands with Some sort of edema and mixoid change in the background. Some undulation is there, and nuclear enlargement is there. Definitely, these cells look bad and worse than these cells. And on the left, bottom left, it is a big structure lined by mucinous epithelium. That much I can see from this part. And the bottom right, it looks something which is getting into the periventricular. No, from the outer half of the muscle to the periventricular tract. Okay. Again, what are the interesting finding we got? If I go back to my first picture on the top, this is adenocarcinoma in situ. This is an in situ component. Why? There is. I did not see any clip reforming. I would say there is absolutely no dysmorphia. It looks just edematous and mixoid with some fibroblast and inflammatory cells. So no dysmorphia. No breakdown, no necrosis, and this is a focus which is away from the main tumor, and it looks like an AIS, adenocarcinoma in situ. And the red left we know on the top right is nephrogenic adenoma. In the three, we have malignant glands appear to transition into focus of goblet cell. If I go to this one, what do you see here? This area, the mucin is preserved. If you see the classical teaching we have from our PGI days. When the mucin is preserved, the cells have a lot of mucin. Probably we are not dealing with a neoplastic or a dysplastic process. Whereas the top half, you do not, you hardly see any mucin with the clearing of the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is not visible rather. So this is the dysplastic change which is happening in the this big gland. So top part looks dysplastic and the bottom part doesn't look dysplastic as normal. And here it is invading into. The, why I'm saying it is invading into because it's evoking a lot of stromal reaction. The cells is a very juicy stroma with a lot of cells, inflammatory cells, and fibroblast, myofibroblast, 
and the cell glands are cribriforming. Once you see cribriforming, cribriforming is not a pattern, it is actually an architectural structure to tell the cells are invaded. So, and seven out of 21 lymph nodes were involved by this process with hemorrhage and stroke. So, what is it? So, in summarizing what we did in the immunohistochemistry from all these cells, the nephrogenic adenoma behaved like a nephrogenic adenoma with positivity for Pax8 and all these things. But the neoplastic cells were negative for CK20 and CDX2, so it is not colonic. They are positive for GATA3, they are positive for CK7, and they are positive for Recibage. And they have a very weak positivity for CA125. So, and the intestinal like gland, which are non dysplastic they were positive for CK20 and CDX2. That is very important. The white part of the gland, this part of the gland were positive for CDX2 and CK20. So the variable pathologies which are going on, these glands are negative for CDX2 and CK20. So what is it? And it was not in the dome of the bladder, it is in the lateral wall. So these are the CK7 positive structures and amateur positive neoplastic glands, which are negative for estrogen receptor, CK20 and CK20. And CDX220 were positive in the non neoplastic or the uh, full subducin containing cells, and the cells are Pax H negative. And this is the focus within the lymph node, which are positive for ERP, and the stroma was positive for CD10, and WT1 also positive. So the variable histology we have an adenocarcinoma, we have some mucinous epithelium, we have without dysplasia, nephrogenic adenoma, and something which is happening, and the clear cell adenocarcinoma area, and something which is happening within the lymph node other than the adenocarcinoma, so we do not know what is it. But the final diagnosis gave is the clear cell carcinoma of the lower urinary tract with areas of nephrogenic adenoma associated, adenocarcinoma in situ, intestinal metaplasia, and lymph node involvement by endosalpingiosis. I'm sorry, I said the CD10 negative, but the stroma was CD10 negative, only the glands were ERPR positive, but they're positive for WG1 and Pax8. So that is the focus, and the ciliated cells, so that is the focus of endosalpingiosis and the area with intestinal metaplasia and dysplasia, adenocarcinoma, and nephrogenic adenoma. With the main actor, which is the clear cell carcinoma of the GYN tract, or not the GYN tract, from the urothelial tract. So take home message is presence of adenocarcinoma in situ and negative metastatic workup. Bladder primary is fibered over a metastasis. Classic architectural patterns that Amacar confirms the diagnosis to be a clear cell adenocarcinoma over an urothelial carcinoma with clear cell carcinoma features. CBI ATPR mitosis, high KI67 and P53 positivity argues against nephrogenic adenoma in those areas where Amacar can be positive in nephrogenic adenoma. Again, absence of endometrial stromal proliferation, just ciliated cells, and what actually helped us in those cells, they have some cilia and they are negative for CD10, they are only positive for ERPR and Pax8 that argues against the endometriotic rather we say it is an endosalpingiosis. I'll go to that slide again. The cells in a hypothesis is visible but not here, but they are like this gland. This is a neoplastic gland. There are some glands which are admixed which are glands of endosalpingiosis. So, can I take a few more minutes or I have to stop here? No, 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 please go ahead. There is enough this, time. Yeah, you enough can time. Okay. okay, can I take like a half a minute break to grab some water and come back? <laughs> yeah, please, please, please. please. Okay, thank you.
Sorry, I'm back. Am I audible, Dr. Nadim? Absolutely audible, clear. Okay. Perfectly. Cool, 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 cool. Great. Okay. So for this case five and six, uh, I thought like I will club these two guys together because they have similar history and essentially the morphology features are pretty much similar with a little variation. So they both presented with thad nodular prostate, high PSA, and 12 core biopsies were performed. So this is for the case one. What you see here, all the cores were involved, and the involvement, the extent of involvement was high. And we have this cribriform structures. You can see here, they look like cribriform structures. They have holes with a solid. And what in the cribriform, another good thing here is, they have a circumscribed cribriform structure. They look, they have a pushing margin. They are not infiltrating in the stroma. Here, basically, it is a biopsy artifact, but it has a clear interface with the stroma and hardly any desmoplastic reaction. These are normal endothelial cells, these are normal smooth muscle cells, some collagen, but it has a very smooth interface with some clefting probably, and it is cribriform. We have holes within those structures. And this is what our cribriform is called. And just remember, when a tumor cell is probably cribriforming, it is not the residual space. These are the new spaces formed by the tumor cell. And here, there's some necrosis, and some calcium is there. It's trying to make calcific mounds, but some necrosis. A mitosis is there. Uh, cells are kind of monomorphic. Some pleomorphism is here, some spindling, but probably I dragged the slide, I don't know. But yeah, there's some spindling is also there. So again, in other areas, what we see, the central areas look like lymphocytes with this gland-like structure, so the acinyl-like structure in the center. And the periphery, it is more regimented, and they are more elongated. I, I would say it kind of reminiscent of the small cell-like features, because I do see a concavity of one cell is fixing into the convexity. Maybe I'm imagining a lot. Here, like a little, um, the concavity of this is fitting in the convexity of this. So it's our adjuperis effect, or not the phenomena. Phenomena is the necrosis. It is the adjuperis effect of nuclear molding. Okay, and there's some gland. Yeah, two types of cells: hypochromatic and vesicular. And here, some necrosis, cell dropout, mitotic activity. Cells to the periphery look a little smudgy, and but what, what you can see, and the cells towards the most periphery, they're like spindle. Here, it kind of look like two cell, but here it could be a fibroblast or it could be a basal cell. I don't know. In the second case, we do have these kind of cells. You can see here, it looks like really ugly. We have the cells towards the periphery, they're round, innocent, they are like making a line with clear cytoplasm and the cells at the top of it are the mongoose, the big huge cells and the intranuclear vacillations, they are of variable size and cells, nucleoli and the bag. So what is it? And this area it looks like a ductal carcinoma in situ if I think about breast. It's a cometo or a cometo what should not be used in histology to the gross terminology. So it has a Necrosis in the center, early necrosis, and a lot of cribriforming. This is another area. Again, I'm kind of emphasizing no dysmoplasia, and the cell has a very smooth contour, the nucleus. I mean, the, the structure has a, the cribriform structure. I would use this as cribriform structures with smooth contour, eosinophilic side. Plasma. And at this point, if I go to the cells, the cells are not really elongated. They're looking elongated somewhere, focally, but mostly they're polyhedral to polygonal to round or the cube water. With cytoplasm, so their NC ratio is not like very tremendously high. They have some cytoplasm, it's like good amount of cytoplasm is there. So how to proceed? We... So at this juncture, I did not think about a cribriform pattern bit because my volume of tumor I'm dealing with in these two cases involving all the 12 cores and in about 60, 70, 80 percent extent. So I'm not dealing with an inside to process, I thought. I mean, it's not a high grade prosthetic intraepithelial neoplasia, though it has features of prosthetic cribriform pattern bit. 
I did not find any area typical of a solid island of prostatic axillary adenocarcinoma or small infiltrative glands going in between the benign non adjacent glands or the benign glands that are going in between that. That kind of focus. Everything what I showed you, I got those focus maximally. So my thought was whether I'm dealing with a cribriform pattern for prostatic axillary adenocarcinoma or it is a prostatic ductal carcinoma with a uh, from pattern which I kind of ruled out because the cells are not elongated, the cells are not dark enough, they have prominent nuclei and it looks more acinar in derivation than ductal in derivation because the nuclei are prominent, the cells are polyhedral to polygonal, the outline is non-infiltrative which is more smooth contoured and the PSA in this case was very high. Typically in ductal adenocarcinomas, just to tell you, the PSA may not be that high as prostatic axinar adenocarcinoma because the ductal cells do not produce PSA. It is the axinar cell which produces PSA. Ductal are the carcinomas, the verumentanum, or they arise from the prostatic cuticle and prostatic duct in the center. So in that area, so they are not PSA positive typically. So I did a pin four cocktail which are, I have three things. We have amica or the rest image, a nuclear stain to highlight the basal cell, which is a P63, and a cytoplasmic stain or a membrane stain for my basal cells, which are CK903 or high molecular cytoplasmic. See here, even if you see one or two basal cells in this cribriform structure with smooth contour, non-desmoplastic stroma, it is not a prostatic acinar adenocarcinoma cryptoform pattern. Oh, my basal cell is maintained, but the cells are neoplastic. The cells are neoplastic because non-neoplastic prostatic epithelium traditionally do not express racemates. Why I'm saying traditionally? Because in injured cases, atrophic, post-radiated setting, even normal glands do show some racemates, which you see kind of positivity. So I said traditionally, when you see so much of racemates positivity, the red color racemates positivity in the pain for cocktail, you stay away from calling something as non-neoplastic or non-cancerous. So I'm dealing with a cancer. I do not know what kind of cancer it is, but it's a cancer where the basal cell is retained. This is another one, basal cell cytoplasmic membrane staining, CK903. Here is also mentioned throughout. So my differential diagnosis here is, am I dealing with a high-grade state or I'm dealing with uh, IDCP. IDCP is intraductal carcinoma of the prostate gland. So what is intraductal carcinoma? I finally signed it out as an intraductal carcinoma of the prostate gland. What is CP? I still is. There's a lot of noise coming in. Please keep your uh, audio off, please. Yeah, I think uh, someone has the audio on or something, so for that reason, a noise is coming. Okay, so what the fundamental difference between an introductal carcinoma versus the lesion pattern 4 is the absence of basal cell layer. But I have a table to show you how normally we should differentiate. What is an introductal carcinoma? We have introductal carcinoma of the prostate and introductal carcinoma of the breast. I, I do both breast and prostate and they both have analogous organ. One has a TDLU and other has a PDLU, prostatic duct axonal unit, a lobular unit. So what do you see? In introductal carcinoma of the breast, it is a precursor lesion or it is something which is a which is going to give rise to an invasive component. It is less erroneous than an invasive, whereas introductal carcinoma of prostate is a pattern of introductal spread of a ductal or acinar adenocarcinoma. It is one way, I mean, it's one way it is kind of ahead of the game. Uh, some uh, devastation has already, the two, I mean, it is a high grade lesion. It is not a lower grade lesion than, it is not a precursor of, what I mean to say, it is not a precursor of acinar adenocarcinoma. It is a pattern of spread of acinar adenocarcinoma through the duct. So, and they so dense or solid cribriform pattern and there is a clean interface or smooth contoured circumscribed interface between the stroma and the cribriform structure. If there are loose cribriform, when you cannot outline the cells, 
or micropapillary, the nuclear size is typically six times that of the normal and presence of necrosis. This of the layer is preserved. Pin versus interductal costume of the prostate. Suppose the volume is little low. In this case, it's like a no-brainer. It's a lot of tumor. You have atypical gland surrounded by basal cell, and we are you are really struggling to call it the high-grade prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia versus interductal costume of the prostate. You talk to the urologist and as per repeat biopsy, probably an unsampled thing has to be come out. In a case where you're getting only introductal carcinoma of the prostate without axinar component, please talk to your urologist and write down in your comment. You have introductal component carcinoma component in the prostate in all the codes amounting to this percentage, next state, or whatever, blah, blah. However, we did not see any axinar component in this biopsy study. Therefore, a reassessment and biopsy has to be done or uh, is recommended to get the unsampled thing out because they're invariably associated with unsampled acinar adenocarcinoma. It all depends on volume and how widespread the involvement is. So there's an article in 2015 differentiating high grade print from introductory people really do not use it in day-to-day -day practice uh, P10 and ARC. Tamara has published this, and when she published, she was a fellow, I mean, it's a great thing, but nobody really used it. It was a great thing in research, but not in the day-to-day -day life. And loss of PGN is usually um, kind of not seen in high-grade prostatic intracellular neoplasia, but uh, you have a loss of tumor suppression when it gets into cancer. IDCP versus infiltrating carcinoma. This is what? This is a benign duct and this is all pure tumor again let's focus on this if you see this one this the little one in the center you have thin spindle cells in the periphery and it has a smooth contour this probably has a smooth contour but if you get into this one this one here, the contour is kind of merging with the periphery with some amount of dysmoplasia. It is angulated. There is no angulation in this one and this one, but there's, there's, these two are angulated. So how they are doing with pin four cocktail? See here. This center one, which has a smooth contour, is IDCP, which is a very important architectural feature to differentiate IDCP from lesion pattern four adenocarcinoma and the rest of the things where Lesion pattern for adenocarcinoma because they have to be forming with loss of. Dr. Mahanti, the pointer is not getting visible from the background. Okay, okay, sure. So, like this one, if I see, this is. Is it visible now? The pointer? I can actually use that arrow option. So, Sorry, let me use that point option, one point. So if I kind of try to draw a smooth circle kind of thing, I can easily draw surrounding this structure. However, if I try with this one, let's try with this one. It has, where is my thing? Yeah, suppose I go with this one. This is kind of merging here with some angulation. This one is also, it, uh, it is merging. So this little one here, it is an infolding. So once you see non-smooth contoured surface, you suspect probably we're dealing with something which is not an ID speed the a from pattern four. So that is what happening here. The central gland with the brown staining for Basal cell, it is IDCP, it is an IDCP, and the rest are cribriform pattern four. Again, focus here on this big gland with a smooth contour and small one like this one. Here, if I kind of draw, just surrounding the arrow area, this area, the entire area. Here, what is happening? This is a focus of lesion three plus four. These are three glands here. This one and this one. It's the three gland. 
this is a three gland with some stroma and this is a tripiform pore tripiform pore why i'm saying these are small infiltrative glands and they do not have a smooth contour surface and this one see here these glands are all positive for amacar without any brown staining on the left it has brown staining this is idcp on the right it is idcp and these are all pattern 3 and 4 asner adenocarcinoma same thing happening here if you see here you can clearly see the basal cells so it is all idcp this how this case is doing let's see basal cell present idcp so when do we do ihc for basal cells on idcp do the basal stains when it could make a difference in if the infiltrative cancer or idcp the volume is low if the volume is high then probably you may not do it in do the basal stain if it could possibly make a difference in the grade it's not usually required in this kind of scenario it is not required i did it for academic purpose but it's not required. intraductal carcinoma of the prostate versus intraductal spread of a urothelial carcinoma because a urothelial carcinoma of the prostatic urethra can get into the prostate so if you see this one what you have you have the cells even towards the periphery that polyhedron the vesicular nucleus and small nucleolus and you do the high molecular cytokeratin is positive in the periphery so you are again between an idcp or it is an intraductal spread of an urothelial carcinoma how about this one there is central necrosis a comedian or a plug is there in the center and is again positive for ck5 by 6 it was positive for high molecular excited cytokeratin ck903 and ck5 by 6 we signed it as intraductal carcinoma why we had a history and if you see clearly morphologically sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate an idcp with hybrid features with intraductal carcinoma the few subtle points in idcp the mitosis may not be very high the mitosis will be very high in urothelial carcinoma as the case of urothelial carcinoma intraductal spread you do see intra cytoplasmic vacuole and mitotic activity there are mitosis here like we have mitosis here the nuclear size and shape variation is there with regular nuclear margin and envelopes the nuclear envelope is kind of very irregular here and prominent chromocenters and prominent nucleoli these are some prominent chromocenters here and the nucleoli are very conspicuous and prominent which you see also in idcp but here the degree of pleomorphism is more as compared to idcp again if you see clearing squamoid differentiation lot of necrosis this is the prostatic duct which looks kind of benign and this is plugged in by a nest of urothelial carcinoma squamous differentiation differentiation will make it easy remember squamous differentiation can be seen in a post irradiated prostate or a prostate which has undergone therapy suppose before doing any sort of surgery or biopsy they have given the patient adt androgen deprivation therapy that produces a lot of squamous metaplasia of the prostatic urethra so you end up calling something as urothelial carcinoma if you do marker for squamous marker they are all going to be positive benign squamous cell malignant malignant squamous cell so in a post adt setting androgen deprivation setting very careful of calling something as benign and malignant if you are looking seeing only squamous cells the hmwck positive they are this is the typical hmwck positivity pattern of an idcp just peripheral pattern in cancer an urothelial carcinoma involving the prostatic duct it is all over the place because everything is urothelial and they are going to be positive for high molecular cytokeratin because the acinar cells which are present in the center they are negative for high molecular cytokeratin gada3 again positive for bladder is going to be negative for prostate significance of idcp only or idcp with low grade prostate cancer suppose you have a low grade tumor or only idcp what to do so the study by dr goa and dr epstein uh, almost like 15 years ago um i have actually 
lucky to see these slides. I was rotating with him during my second year of residency. Uh, what are the introductory features, histologic features, and clinical significance of the finding? What they did, they took six radical prostatectomy specimens with high grade infiltrating axonal adenocarcinoma lesion pattern eight or nine. No extraprostatic extension or very focal extraprostatic extension are seen in five out of those six cases. Three of the 16 who did not undergo radical prostatectomy developed bone metastasis. So this is the baseline clinical demographic data. So in this study, what this, so the, the studies prior to this, the IDCP represent an advanced stage of tumor product progression or introductory spread. So considering this, we should treat the patient aggressively or should not treat the patient aggressively. The, the consensus now is the treatment, the patient should be aggressively treated because this is not a precursor, this is a progression pattern of acinar adenocarcinoma. Then Brian and Dr. Epstein, uh, they did another study without invasive carcinoma, emphasizing on radical prostatectomy in general of urology. So what they found in the follow-up in 66 patients, of the 21 patients with radical prostatectomy, reviewed the slide and they look for both IDCP and invasive carcinoma. There are cases where the tumor has already progressed, but visible acinar carcinoma is seen in only 10% of the cases. So that means with IDCP, they have progressed. So the definitive therapy is recommended in the main with IDCP and little core biopsy, even in the absence of pathologically documented invasive prostate cancer. This is another case with again descriptive form structures, some angulations, not some smooth contour. This is fairly smooth contour, self retaining monotony. The cells are not pleomorphic here. I know like the kids, they use the word pleomorphic nowadays a lot. They're not pleomorphic. They look, they are uniformly enlarged. They have a prominent nuclei, but they are big, uniformly big. Again, necrosis, but the basal cell layer is maintained. What you see from here, the surface the is epithelial and the mesenchymal junction the interface is non-infiltrative non-desmoplastic oh this is nothing for this one so not this one also i'll skip so the distinctive morphologic pattern versus the high grade pain it is usually associated with or almost invariably associated with high grade cancer and poor pathology at radical prostatectomy and relatively poor prognosis with other therapy in most cases it's an advanced stage of tumor progression with introductory spread of the tumor, and rarely it shows an inside to process like breast. Justified to treat the patient's introductory component and biopsy even in the absence of documented invasive or infiltrating prostate cancer. Grading, it is hard to tell if IDC are infiltrating cancer in many cases without stain, so do not grade it. Recommend to treat it as high-grade infiltrating cancer, so why not just call it a high-grade prostate cancer instead of trying hard to give it a semantics. In other organs, like in breast, we do not grade. So here you just say it's high grade. Uncommonly, only IDC or IDCP may be present in radical prostatectomy. So grading the biopsy as high grade gives wrong prognostic information. Current recommendation is to do basal cells if no obvious infiltrative. If there is a case with only IDCP, no infiltrating, obvious infiltrating cancer is seen, then please go for basal cells. What are the differences between cryptiform pattern 4 and IDCP? Most important thing is you have a rounded and circumscribed pushing interface with the stroma in IDCP, whereas irregular infiltrative acini present in pattern 4 cryptiform. Let's stick to the morphology first. No desmoplasia in IDCP. Some desmoplasia can be seen in infiltrative pattern 4. You have the acini are large than the normal acid eye, but they do not so the branching within they rather have a branching outside IDCP branch so a lot of convolution branching inside not outside basal cells are absent your basal cells are intact how to differentiate ductal adenocarcinoma from IDC ductal adenocarcinoma looks like an endometrioid adenocarcinoma of the uterus the dual tract and they have cribriform slit like structures and the cells are long pension cell shell with papillary front in both the cases, you have the basal cell retained. This was a lot of pseudostratification papillary front, whereas IDCP hardly saw any papilla formation. They do have a micropapilla without a fibrovascular core, where the length of the papilla is about four to five times that of the width, and the cells are cuboidal. So this is just to complete today's talk. 
you have something which looks like a joint tract tumor with elongated stratified tumor cells, multilayering of the tumor cells, and you hardly see any cytoplasm. Rather, you see a lot of nuclear balls occupying the space. There's a ball of nuclear, the mound, or a cluster of nuclei occupying the space with little intervening cytoplasm. You cannot say where the cell starts and where the cell ends, and they are stratified. This is what. And they have papilla formation, like a fibrovascular core or a vascular core with little fibrous tissue, and cribriform structures. It's kind of different, different from IDCP. Thank you. I can take a few questions now. Uh, we have a question. We have a we have a uh, chat comment from Dr. Bala from PGI Chandigarh. Yeah. He Bala, says, dear, uh, yeah, Dala, that's right, Bala uh, Morugan. He yeah. says, dear sir, we recently had biopsy from hepatic SOL in a known case of metastatic SNR carcinoma post ADT. The morphology was small islands with squamoid morphology. P40 mm -hmm. and GATA3 was diffused positive and PSA negative. If we reviewed the previous biopsy, which showed three plus four pattern. How do we categorize? Yes, that's a great question. And I had a case. I was completely screwed before signing out. I was almost in the verge of signing that case out, but God saved me. So what happens if you have a post ADT setting case? You do not have any clue and no history, and you looked at the biopsy. It looks like if everything is squamous. Sometimes they look even ugly. So you thought probably the first pathologist has misdiagnosed this case as prostate. It's a prostate bladder cancer because GATA3 is known to be positive in squamous epithelium. So GATA3 positivity, P40, P63, CK5, 5 by 6, all this positivity can see in the metaplastic squamous epithelium following post-ADT even at the metastatic site. Suppose you have a nodal metastasis. The patient has received androgen deprivation either as a drug or by castrating the testicles, so in that case, what you see, they saw extensive squamous metaplasia and they're known to show atypical squamous metaplastic change. Immunostain doesn't help here. If you do NKX, my case helped me because NKX 3.1 was positive in those cells. So those are basic, there are some cells which are NKX 3.1 positive. That means there are residual prostate cancer cells which are kind of hidden by extensive metaplastic squamous cells which looks atypical. They even look more atypical than the prostate cancer cells because the prostate cells are more monotonous even at the metastatic site. So be careful. Do not waste your money on doing any squamous marker in this case. I request you even do not do GATA3, CK7, CK20, no, nothing. Just if you are really kind of want to be sure, do a NKX 3.1 and close your report. Does it help, Bala? Dr. Bala, you can ask directly. You can just, uh, you know, switch your microphone on and ask Dr. Mohanty straight away. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, this is a great, great question. I appreciate. Yes, sir. Anybody you, sir. who wants to ask any other question can put their microphone on and ask a question. Dr. Mohanty is still online. So I think uh, there are none. So uh, thank you, Dr. Mahanti, for this extraordinary, wonderful, amazing lecture. Uh, I uh, We have not had enough of you. So we would request you to take one more class, maybe sometime on the 19th of August. Yeah, I had a uh, couple of good cases in testicular tumor, renal, and penile cancers. So I, I would love to take a one or two cases. Excellent. So we, we, we would like to have you on the 19th at 7.30 again. Yeah, and this time I other... promise I'm going to be careful. I'll have my computer. <laughs> no, 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 that's perfectly all right. That's perfectly all right. And for all the people who are there right still with us, uh, I would like to thank everybody who are here and people who have joined on the YouTube. And we have uh, people from the from uh, Far East also who have joined in. Thank you very much for joining. And before I close, let me tell you that on the 26th and 28th of August, we'll be having Dr. Uh, <coughs> Raja Guru from uh, Kuwait. He'll be talking on hepatic lesions. I wow. hope everybody joins there. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. And we still continue to have our normal Europath classes as usual. We'll be announcing mm -hmm. them as also. Thank yeah. you so much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Mahanti, once again. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.